of you know Wendy really well. She's done lots of talks for us, both in the hall, in the college, and also online. So thank you so much, Wendy. And uh, we will we'll hand straight over to you. So welcome again, and also welcome to people who'll be watching this on the YouTube, on the recorded version. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. In October 2019, uh, six of us from our country traveled to Zambia and everything was wonderful. We couldn't imagine at that time the dreadful virus that was going to hit us all. January this year, I was pre feeling pretty fed up, you know, <coughs> New Year's Day, nothing to look forward to, nothing seemed to be changing. And then I got an um, email from Sendacal. And it was telling me about a, a virtual relay, which sounds absolutely daft, but I jumped in with my usual enthusiasm to take part. And the idea is that we're collectively walking or running or cycling or swimming or hopping or whatever um, to collectively travel 5,400 miles, which is from the highlands of Ethiopia to the grasslands of Zambia. How daft does that sound? Anyway, there you can see the countries we're going through, and these are all the countries that Sendakao is actually working in at the moment. And I'm very sad that we're no longer working in the Sutu, but my goodness, that would have added some miles if we were still there. I've been to all of these countries apart from Burundi, and Burundi is not terribly safe, so it's unlikely that I'll ever get there. But anyway, we are working there. And so the idea is we raise money to help with the pandemic in these countries. And 60 pounds provides a family with their hygiene training, skills to build a tip tap, which you would know about because I've talked about it before, harvesting rainwater and building a clean latrine. And last time I looked at my sponsor page, I'd raised enough money for six, I think. So I'm doing quite well, and uh, it's a 12-week operation, so I've still got plenty of time. And here's me in two of these countries. There's the summit of Rastechen. This wasn't with Sendakao, it was um, a travel company we went with, and I climbed to the summit of the highest mountain, 4,800 metres. And we arrived there about 7 o'clock in the morning, I think, to watch the sunrise. An armed guard was compulsory. We never saw the reason for it, but he was with us all the time. That was the lad who carried the water container and this was our guide, Getanet. And then 2019, here's me in the grasslands of Zambia. And I bet in the intervening years, I've walked more than those 5,000 miles anyway. So, how does Sendakao work? You'll all remember this, I'm sure, from my previous talks. It started in 1988. You'll remember Idi Amin had just been deposed in Uganda after 25 years of terror and tyranny. And things were beginning to settle down with Museveni. And about that time, we were having trouble. Do you remember the milk lakes and the butter mountains and the EEC quotas? And basically, our farmers couldn't sell their milk and were having to pour it away. And of course, we've always been a country that produces lots of milk. So it was an absolute tragedy for our farmers. A bishop came over about that time from Uganda and he was talking to a group of Christian farmers in the West Country. And they were telling him about our problems. And he started telling them about the problems we were having in Uganda. Lots and lots of widows, their husbands had been killed by Idi Amin. And they were struggling with their small plots of land to bring up their families. And they got talking. And somebody said, wouldn't it be a good idea to send some cows out to Uganda? Sounded a daft idea, but they researched it. And at the end of 1988, they had, I think, 25 pregnant Frisian Holsteins, our lovely black and whites, to send to Uganda. Uh, the ladies had been trained in managing these cows, and it was a brilliant success. 
And we went on sending cows for quite some time, but we don't do it anymore. And of course, the organisation has changed quite a lot. So we don't give animals so much. And in Zambia, we don't give animals at all. You'll see why in a minute. So there are the cows going out. And this is David Bragg, one of our members who I know quite well. He's actually doing this sponsor. I think he's cycling because he's doing far more miles than me. But uh, he was one of the first farmers to send a cow out. <coughs> and some of you may know Anthony and Sandra Herbert of Western Pastures. Uh, they're involved in Send a Cow, and they actually sent a cow out as well. So, we don't ask people what they need, we ask people what they've got, and then we build on that. So they're African design solutions, what they actually need, what, they, what people may think they need. Farming systems, training them in so many different ways, raised beds, keyhole gardens, bank gardens, double dog beds, all the things I've talked about in the past. And a new technique that I hope I'm going to be able to show you later on, fingers crossed. It's called push-pull. And it's a technique to protect the maize crops, which is absolutely brilliant. Hopefully I'll be able to show you a bit about it later. One of our biggest things we have to work on in African countries is gender and social inclusion. Those of you who've been to Africa would have seen or other place women carrying water, children carrying water, rarely the men. And it seemed to me when I first went out there that the women did all the work. That is changing, certainly in our projects. Women are far more involved in decision making, in handling the money, and it's making a big difference. Enterprise development. There you can see a group of ladies in a cooperative and they're drying maize, ready to sell. So cooperative groups working together. It's giving them more food security. Um, the surplus is providing in, in income, marketing, bulk storage, processing, drying. It really is taking off and working very well. And we also have um, small banking systems where people can borrow money to buy seeds or whatever they need and pay it back with a small amount of interest. And that is run by the group themselves and seems to be working really well. Passing on, one of the cornerstones of Send a Cow, which I'm sure I've told you about before, is passing on the gift. So whatever you get, if it's a pregnant Frisian Holstein, when she has a a female calf, you will in due course pass that calf on to another family. If you give them seeds when you get your crop, you'll pass on seeds to another family. And these ladies are being trained by Elena, who I met, and she's training them in the use of one of these um, fuel saving stoves. They call them geco stoves in that area. I'm not quite sure why, but uh, basically it's a hollow structure the wood goes in there and provides the heat. It's just a simple thing made of um, clay and concrete. And you can uh, heat a pan on the top of it. And there's Elena explaining it to them. So these are the countries we've worked in. And we went to Zambia in October 2019 never dreaming that this dreadful pandemic was going to um, hit us. It's a very poor country. Goodness knows how they're managing. I do know that it's some um, curbing travel and curbing people getting to markets to sell their produce. So I'm sure it's making a tremendous difference to them. Anyway, six of us went from the UK and we flew into Lusaka, which is the capital city. And we had one night there and then we traveled up the Luangwa River to an area here, and then back again down to there, and eventually back to Lusaka. And here you can see, this is the um, Zambezi, where the Luangwa joins the Zambezi. So, one night in a luxury hotel, <laughs> after a very long journey, a uh, quick swim in the swimming pool, and then we were off. We met our country director, White Mubala, a lovely man who came to meet us. And the first thing we did was go to the office. 
uh, we met all the syndical staff there and then we all piled into three vehicles with our three drivers and we had a six hour journey to Pitoke crossing the river. You can see how dry it is. There are three seasons in Zambia. Um, the wet season runs from about November. So they were expecting the rains to come when we were there. And then the uh, dry season. And wait a minute, I've lost track. There is another season. Yes. It's rainy from November till April. It's cold from May to July and warm or hot from August until the rains start in November. So they were expecting the rains, but everything was dry and dusty and very difficult. And here we got to the river and there was a, a village there with a market, the usual raffia baskets and things that you see, and loads and loads of fish. Now, I don't like the smell of fish. And as you can imagine, this was extremely smelly. So I've mentioned the river, there it is going down there and here's the Zambezi. So it uh, meets the Zambezi there. Crossing the river, we could see how dry it was. Look at that um, dry river bank there. It should all be filled with water and would be in another month or so. But at the time, everything looked very desolate, very dry. Now the roads at this point were quite good, but uh, those of you who've been to Africa will know that the roads deteriorate pretty quickly into mud. Um, it must be a nightmare in the wet season. We've had a few hairy journeys, but at the moment it's very dry, very rutted and uh, very difficult to travel. So we arrived at our lodge, a beautiful place. It was our accommodation for three nights. This was my room here. And uh, we had a, a good night's sleep. And we met our lovely angels and motorbikes. These are three people from our Petoke, from our Petoke um, office, Imelda, Mundia and Webster. And they'd come on their motorbikes to greet us and say hello which was wonderful. All three of them were smashing people. Lovely and um, good English. And they looked after us so well and explained everything and translated for us. They were absolutely brilliant. So the first thing we did after a good night's sleep was to visit the local district commissioner. It's just polite to let him know who we are and what we're doing. He knew already, of course, he'd been briefed. But uh, there's me at the front. This is Emily from the office and Victoria from the office. And then there's Chris. Now, I don't know whether Chris is in on this talk. I do hope so. I let her know yesterday, but of course it was uh, rather late when she got the message. So she may not have seen it. And then these are two of our supporters, Jeremy and Teresa. So six of us have traveled from the UK. There should have been seven. But unfortunately, one of our number was poorly and couldn't come, which was a real shame. So we talked to the district commissioner. He took us into his office and he talked about the initiatives in their area. And he spoke very warmly about Sendical uh, and about the good work we were doing, which was great. Local councillor, Roy Tembo, he met us as soon as we got out of the vehicles, um, introduced his wife who was there. And as I say, he knew a lot about Sendikau. He was asking us all sorts of questions and he was keen to tell us what had been happening in his area. And then we met the chief and it transpired at that moment that Roy's wife was the sister of the chief's wife. So that's why I think he knew so much about us. Uh, the chief took us into his home, made us very welcome. Now, it's traditional in that area, and we hadn't realised, that you kneel down to greet the chief. So we all had to kneel down at my age and for Chris as well. That is not particularly easy. It's all right getting down, but it's getting up again. That's a bit undignified. But anyway, we managed it. We all knelt down. They sang a song to the chief and we clapped. 
and then we got up and sat down while he talked to us. And again, he spoke very warmly about Senator Cow, and that's all of us. While he was uh, telling us about uh, life in the area. And there you can see his wife and her sister together. So his wife took us out to look at her beautiful garden. All sorts of things. She got pumpkins growing, she got amaranthus, spinach, lots of vegetables I didn't recognize. But this is one of the problems. All the gardens have to be fenced to protect them from roaming hungry animals. I said that uh, we don't give any animals in Zambia. And you can see why. There are animals all over the place and they're just roaming around. And of course, they'll eat anything in sight. So the Sendakau gardens have to be um, fenced in. I spoke to White about it and he said, well, it's a cultural thing. It takes a long, long time to change it. So I don't know what will happen in the long run, but that explains why we don't give animals in that area. So this was one of the associations we went to. Lovely ladies all waiting for us and waiting to greet us. And the greetings we get in these places are just wonderful. I just absolutely love it. So they got together, they all stood up and they danced and sang to welcome us. Now my next clip, if it works, will let you hear them singing. Oh yes. lovely. I didn't take that. Chris took it on her iPad and she sent it to me. It took me a long time to get it to work but uh, I have got two clips in this and I hope they both work. So thank you Chris if you're listening. That was brilliant. Um, large water tanks. Water of course as you've guessed is a tremendous problem and these have been supplied by Sendakal and they're working very well. So the water is there for everybody to share. And this is one of our keyhole gardens that I've mentioned to you before. We've got one in our garden at home and we're still harvesting um, various herbs and things from it, even though it's the middle of winter and it's brilliant. So it's a raised bed. Uh, there you can see the fence to protect it from the animals. It's got a compost basket in the middle. So all your potato peelings, your carrot tops, etc., go in that. They rock down and feed the soil. And because it's raised, when they do get the rainfall, which is pr pretty torrential, it stops the soil washing away. So it really does work. And it's called a keyhole garden because when you look down on it, there's a little notch where you can walk in to um, tend the compost basket. And that is Chris with her iPad. And we've already talked about the fuel saving stove. And this is Alina talking about it. She's one of the trainers. And Chris very kindly recorded her and sent me a transcript of what she said. So Alina said, whenever I'm taught something, my heart tells me, no, you cannot fail. Do it. And I really do it. And sometimes when I see someone doing something, I ask myself, if they can do it, why can't I? So whatever I'm capable of, I do, I must do it. And then Chris asked her if she trained other people. And she said, I trained some other people, my fellow farmers. And I tell them, you can do what I do. For example, my neighbor, I'm always encouraging her by telling her, look, I don't buy vegetables, I grow them. And she says, I will do it. And I say, don't just say you'll do it, do it by action. I suspect that Alina is quite a bossy person, but I'm sure she gets results. So there she's showing one of these fuel saving stoves and it does save, it uses about 25% of the wood that an open firewood. And of course you don't have the dangers of 
children burning themselves on an open fire, smoke inhalation, etc. So they really are brilliant. Typical of lots of the places we go to, this is the cook house. Uh, there you can see the drying rack up on stilts to stop animals and pests getting to it. And there you can see the very simple household implements. Again, look how barren, look how dry everything is. Lots of children everywhere. The children are always lovely. They're curious and want to know what these strange white people are doing there. And this is Anna. Anna is secretary for the um, association and she was lovely. We spent quite a lot of time talking to her. And she talked about the importance of remembering that she is secretary for the group. So she's got to consider what the group does rather than what she does herself. And she said, always, I think of the group, what's best for the group. And there are some of her children, all boys. But she told us that the boys are beginning to help. And the boys are beginning to collect water. The boys can wash up. And it was tremendous. I'll talk a bit more about that <coughs> in a minute. Now, she has her own shop. And on the 13th of January 2020, she featured in the garden, in the Guardian, sorry. Um, I've got it, I'll show you in a minute. So this is Anna's shop. And the way it works, she's got absolutely everything. She's got animal medicines there. So people come to her to buy their medicines. She gives them information. She lends them the funnels if they need them to treat their animals. And she really is quite knowledgeable. And apart from that, she's got all the usual household things. There's a lovely bag there that somebody made for her to sell. She'd even got fabric. It was just wonderful. Fabric up there hanging well-stocked shop and here she is in the garden i scanned it but it didn't work out terribly well so i've written down what she said i'll just give you a minute to read it So I think it was an article about the New Year's Honours. In her shop, she had some bicycle parts for sale, which really amused us. And she explained that. Here is her husband, and his name is John Lungo. And John Lungo is the person who does the, who does the trading for them a bit more. Thank you. Um, he works very hard. He takes their goods to town. He used to take them on the bike. He piled everything up on the bike. So he took produce from Anna's garden and sold it. And then in the town, he would buy things to bring back and sell in the shop. And they had done so well that they managed to trade in the bike, which is <laughs> part that she was selling in the shop. And he's now got a small vehicle. Goodness knows what's happened to them during the pandemic, whether they're managing to do any trading, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Beatrice, and she's in the process of building a house there. Wonderful keyhole garden. Curious children again. Um, at night, the animals are shut in pens, but during the day, as I've said, they just roam around all the time. And we arrived to see Monica, but she wasn't there. So her husband took us around. Uh, his garden was some distance from the house. He was growing weeds for thatching. He'd been to the market that morning and he told us how much money he'd raised. I've forgotten now, but he'd sold a lot of produce. Um, he went with his cart and he had beehives in there. Now I know to my cost about African bees, so we avoided that. 
had two water sources at each end of the garden. They're very low at the moment, but he's waiting for the rains to come. And of course, they make a big difference to what he can grow. And here's his ox cart, which he uses to take his produce to market. And as I said, with travel restrictions, I don't know what's happening. Round nut dryers to stop pests getting in. And the animals again. Irene. Irene was a lovely lady. Um, she was a dealer. She sold seeds, but she didn't own the business. So she got a proportion of what she sold. But she told us she was working towards the time when she could buy her own seed and make the profit for herself. Some of her, they will be grandchildren, I should imagine. There's her tip tap, simple hand washing device. She had a pig roaming around and she showed us that was the pig sty. And then for Nelly, whose husband makes school uniforms from his home. And she showed us this house, which was for her children, but a disorientated hopkinopotamus had destroyed it. Fortunately, no one was hurt and they've managed to build it up again. Beautiful garden and they were working together. Lots of animals again. And we're going back across the river to visit projects in another area. So back through this very smelly market and we got out to stretch our legs and uh, had a look at all the stores and the people were so friendly. It was really, really lovely. Right, how are we doing for time, Peter? We're doing fine. We've got eight minutes left, Wendy. Eight minutes left. Okay. So, has anybody got any questions for me? Um, in the in the chat box, Wendy, yeah. there's um, Jenny is asking: Are the seasons reliable, or does there tend to be more drought these days? Yes, there's definitely more drought. Um, they told us how difficult it was getting, you know, the drier seasons just last longer, the rains are later coming, the rains are shorter when they do come. So yes, it's very difficult, climate change is affecting Zambia considerably. And now with the pandemic as well, I'm sure it's even more difficult. Yeah. Mm. Can you, can you not? Could you get news of them from the Sandakau office? Do they keep yes, in touch yes. with the people? Yes, they do. Um, they're regularly in touch with White, who's our director out there. Um, the last I heard, I haven't got any numbers about deaths, etc. The main thing was the poor health care, of course, the poor hygiene, which is um, a very basic thing for us. But managing to wash their hands, of course, is not easy for people. And healthcare is pretty desperate. Life, life expectancy before the pandemic was the sixth lowest in the world. So Gosh. goodness knows what it is now, yes. Yes, um, there's a lot of AIDS in the country and malaria, of course, not in this particular area we've been, but there was malaria in the next um, area we went to. And diseases such as diarrhea, high school dropouts, it really is a difficult country, but they are very positive and white seemed to think that things were improving. But as I say, the pandemic will have uh, stopped things, of course. Hmm. One thing I forgot to mention about Anna, you remember the lady with the shop whose husband yeah. traded goods for her? When people came to the shop at first who weren't in the Sendical project, they didn't understand the fact that her boys were carrying water and washing up and her husband was helping her. And they were very indignant about it. They said, no, no, you're putting far too much pressure on them. It's not good for them. 
but she told us that gradually as time went on, she noticed that they were changing and their children were starting to help. And I think that's wonderful. It's one of the things I love about Sandy Cow. It's what we call over the hedge learning. People who aren't necessarily in the projects get the ideas and they start using them as well. So it was obviously working in that area. Anyway, back to our uh, three lovely, back to our three lovely staff. They had to go back to the Patoke office to get on with their work. They'd been lovely. They'd been really helpful, and it was great to have uh, met them. So we travelled on from there, and this time we went on a sort of sightseeing trip just for half a day so so we went to the confluence of the two rivers the Zambezi and the Luangwa and we could see over into Mozambique there and over into Zambia and there were these this group of people getting ready to go out to their fishing camp I'm not sure where the fishing camp was some uh, White said it was on an island somewhere, but they were loading up their boats with all these supplies and they stay away for quite some time, apparently. And there we could see over into Zimbabwe, a town on the other side. And two of our friends, Jeremy and Teresa, after they left us, they actually went down to the falls and spent some time there. It was a bit disappointing because it was the dry season and there wasn't enough water in, but I'm sure they were spectacular in spite of that. And we met this lady who knew one of our drivers. She sort of latched onto us for a while and was around with us. But uh, people were so friendly. They all wanted to know what we were doing there and they wanted to know all about us, which was lovely. And there's the fish ready to be loaded up. It's obviously a big, big industry. And I've commented on the smell already. <laughs> it was pretty awful, but uh, it was all going off to market. And again, I don't know how the pandemic is affecting that. People not able to travel. So back to the uh, market again. And we were traveling in our vehicles again quite a, a busy little place and then this was our next hotel it was very very basic but white told us it was the only one in the area it was suitable so it was okay they were friendly enough it was nice um this was a mosquito area so we, we were having to take our malaria tablets from i think two days before we got there we hadn't had any trouble until then and this was my room was right on the edge. Uh, the river is down here. And this lovely creature, no idea what it was called, but it kept me mosquito free. Um, I don't know if it was the same one. I saw one inside my room and one outside, but isn't it beautiful? What a lovely colour. And I certainly didn't have any bites all the time I was there, so it obviously worked. That was the dining room. And I went out for a walk early one morning. Animals everywhere. These goats sort of herded me along. And uh, we could see down to the village below. And there are some of us gathered. There's Chris. And Jeremy and Teresa. And there's White and our drivers and we were just posing for a photograph while we all met to get on the vehicles and then we came to another place where the uh, Luangwa group were waiting to greet us so singing dancing and then they performed a play for us we've seen versions of this play many times it was about a man who was a, a drunken wastrel spending all his time sitting around in the sun and drinking. And Sendikow came along, trained his wife, and he gradually <laughs> learned the error of his ways and started to help his wife. And he did this with great gusto. He was a very dramatic man. And uh, he got it across to us quite clearly. 
So after that, we had the singing and dancing and celebration. And then each of them stood up and talked to us about their lives. And we talked to them about our lives. And it's just wonderful to do it. And they took us round their village, um, solar dryers, a brilliant way of preserving fruit and vegetable. So they put it in there, leave it in the sun until it's dried, and that preserves it, of course. And that's some of the stuff they've made. And they'd actually made cakes with us and gave us all a little taste of this cake. Maculata. Seven children and three other dependents. And that's often when a member of the family has died of AIDS and uh, they take on the children. We saw that an awful lot of the time. And this was right on the river. So no real problems with irrigation. Beautiful bananas. We did see some evidence on her farm of the fall army worm. Uh, it's a big problem in Africa. It seems to be sweeping the whole of the continent. It's a nasty little pest. And she showed us it, first time I've ever seen it. She showed us some on her farm. I didn't take a photograph, unfortunately. But there you can see the water channels going through the farm. And again, the ubiquitous animals wandering around. Now this is Veronica. And Veronica was actually in the last um, place we went to. And I was very disappointed because I was due to meet Veronica. And then we couldn't. We got a message on the morning she was coming to say that she'd had to take her daughter to the hospital. I've already mentioned one of her daughters uh, became pregnant under fairly dire circumstances. And so she'd had to go to the hospital with her. So I was very disappointed that I couldn't meet Veronica. But uh, Imelda sat down with me. She gave me all the information. So I made copious notes and Senda Cow gave me the photographs. So I feel I can talk about her. It was interesting because um, Imelda had the same surname and I didn't realize till afterwards, but uh, they may have been related, of course. So Veronica, she was the focus of our Christmas appeal last year, which was in, which was why I was looking forward to seeing her. And there she is with one of her daughters carrying water. I'm sure if you've been to Africa, you've seen this all over the place. African ladies have the most beautiful deportment and it's from carrying things on their heads. They often get us to try and of course we fail miserably because our necks aren't strong enough. They start um, very early on in their lives. So sadly, Veronica and her husband had their children. I think they had five children altogether. And then they discovered they were both HIV positive. Her husband died and Veronica is well looked after and she seems to be very healthy at the moment. But of course, it's always there in the background, isn't it? And this is some members of her family outside her home. And this is the well that Senda Cow has helped to put in. Um, she told us that uh, it's um, often damaged and so it has to be locked and the man from the village comes to repair it. But there you can see all the water containers ready to be filled up. Yes, they had five children and she joined a widow's self-help group who got involved with Senda Cow. This was in 2016. So she'd been with the charity for three years when, uh, when we should have met her. She was desperate to learn how to store water when it actually rains. So she built these um, storage tanks. As you can see, there's no water in at the moment, but apparently they are very effective and they do hold the water when it comes. So she'd worked very hard at that. And this is her open fire. She didn't seem to have a, a stove. Lovely lady. I'm very, very proud of her training. Um, her own house reasonably good. She has a keyhole garden, a banana plantation, 
She's recently planted oranges and granadillas, which is a type of fruit. And she's very proud of that. She's got a tip tap, a long drop toilet, a drying rack, wow. and she has got a fuel saving stove. And Imelda reported that the thing she'd found most useful was the training in compost making, which had actually taken place in her compound and now she trains other people in it. Long queues to use the borehole, so she's very keen on the water harvesting. And um, she sold chickens and guinea fowl to buy cement for it. And she's lined her structure to make it watertight. And the plan is that when the baby is born, Veronica will look after the baby because her um, child has to go back to school. So it's all very delicate, but she seems a very determined, strong woman. So I'm sure she'll be successful. And here they are in their maize field. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about maize. Maize is one of the biggest crops in Zambia. Um, and unfortunately, it's taking a lot of the space that could be used for people to grow their own vegetables. And unfortunately, they don't get enough money from the maize. The buyers are not particularly generous. And there are all sorts of problems with growing maize. So this push-pull technology has been developed to combat that. Now I've got a lovely five minute video and with a bit of luck, we'll be able to show it at the end. We managed it yesterday after a lot of uh, struggling. So fingers crossed, but just in case it doesn't work, I've just written a very, very brief um, description of it. So it's a strategy designed for controlling three of the main problems, stem borers, parasitic striga weed and, sorry, <laughs> stem borers, parasitic striga weed and poor soil, soil degradation. So there's the striga weed, a very pretty purple plant, but uh, causes devastation. Yes. And that's the um, mm -hmm. stem borer yeah. and that's the moth. So this of course is the pupa, the caterpillar and there's the moth at the bottom and this demonstrates what the striga weed does it's parasitic so it latches onto the roots takes all the nourishment uh, to the detriment of the maize so this is the idea push pull the push is plants that emit chemicals and they push the stem borer moths away so the best plant for this is Desmodium. It effectively suppresses the striga weed and it's a highly nutritious animal feed, That's so win-win. Nice. And then the pull is the companion grasses, which are planted between and among the crops. And the adult moths are attracted by them. And these grasses provide the pull. And if you grow napier grass, which I've actually seen all over Africa, is particularly effective because it <coughs> secretes a subject Maybe which traps the moths. It really does work brilliantly. So that's it in a nutshell. I hope that we're going to have time to show you the video, but uh, fingers crossed. So we attended a very big ceremony. We weren't quite sure what it was. It was like one of our carnivals, I suppose but it was the local celebration, very important. The local chief was there and uh, we were welcomed as honored guests. Now you can see the excitement building up. Everybody came from the whole village, from the whole district rather. They had stores, mm. there were vehicles everywhere. It was really exciting. And as we were walking in, everybody was waving to us and greeting us vehicles packed with people coming in or waving and then we saw some ladies dancing and with a bit of luck yes here we are <laughs> so 
so we were ushered in and we were given seats in a big stand and then people with microphones introduced us. We all had to stand up so everybody could have a good look at us and see where we are. And it made us, we really felt welcome. It was super. So various people dancing and singing and celebrating, then lots and lots of speeches. And then we all trooped over to this little hut. And the hut, somebody explained to us, is where the traditional war drums are kept. They're kept in this hut and everybody goes once a year to pay their respects. And on this table, people started leaving money and everybody had to kneel down. And again, poor Chris and I had to kneel down on the ground and heave ourselves up very inelegantly. But it was quite a spectacle and the atmosphere was just lovely. That's uh, Kebby, I think, one of our staff. And traditional drumming and dancing. Marching bands, speeches. And then we had to present gifts to the local area chief. And for some reason I was chosen. So this lady escorted me right across the parade ground and again, <laughs> I had to kneel down and he greeted me. He spoke quite good English. There's Kebby with us. And um, I had to present our gifts. And I think I gave him a T-shirt and a send a cow badge and this box of shortbread, which had a Union Jack on one side and um, <laughs> a picture of a London bus on the other. And he appeared to be delighted with it. So, back to Lusaka, and Lusaka. while we were there, we met a man from uh, one of the other charities, and he was telling us about the street children who live under the bridge in Lusaka. Chris and I went out for a walk, and he caught us up and asked us if we wanted to go and meet the street children, but we declined that. I think uh, we had our heads full of Sendikau and didn't really want to get involved with anything else. But uh, we had a walk around the town. It was quite nice, quite pleasant. And uh, everybody we met was very friendly. We didn't feel unsafe for an instant. Beautiful frame trees everywhere. Oh. They're lovely, aren't they? It's lovely. Very yes. Nice. Mm. So... I got to the bottom of the, got to the end of the talk. Okay, the With a character. bit of luck, we'll be able to play the push pull video. And if anybody would like to sponsor me on my sponsored walk, as I've said, uh, I think Tricia has sent you the link. Or you can go to the Sendicow website, and uh, any donations will be very gratefully received. So I'm going to close this down now. I hope. And hopefully, we're going to go into the video. Keep your fingers crossed. Have we got it? Yes, we have. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so this is explaining our techniques. Sendakau supports farmers in sub-Saharan Africa to grow themselves out of poverty by giving communities the hope and the means to secure their own futures from the land. Our approach empowers families with the confidence, skills and self-belief to grow sufficient food and generate income while regenerating the natural environment, protecting ecosystems and enhancing biodiversity. As Farm Systems Coordinator, I work with our in-country teams to find and design innovative and cost-effective solutions to the challenges smallholder farmers face such as falling crop yields, soil degradation and pests. Smallholder farmers are often wholly dependent on agriculture for their livelihoods, growing a variety of staple crops, including maize. Maize is one of the major crops grown in the world, and in Africa alone the lives of 300 million people depend on it. However, erratic weather patterns combined with parasitic weeds, such as striga weed, and destructive insects like stem borer moth can completely decimate maize crops, resulting in widespread hunger and poverty. 
The common response to these pests would be chemical pesticides, but these are often devastating for ecosystems and water supplies. Smallholder farmers are often in a very difficult position. Their families are severely malnourished, but they don't have the means to protect their crops from pests. Sendikau has teamed up with the CPE to implement Push-Pull, an affordable, nature-based solution to falling maize yield. The following explanation shows how it works. To properly understand the need for Push-Pull, we must first look at two pests, the Stembora moth and Striga weed. First, the Stembora moth. They lay their larvae on maize stems and leaves, and when they hatch, the larvae literally bore through the stems and leaves, hence their name. Secondly, Striga weed is a parasitic weed. Its roots latch onto the maize and drain it of nutrients. Together, Striga and the Stembora can wipe out an entire crop. Push-Pull technology is an integrated pest management system which can mitigate both pests. Farmers start by intercropping maize with desmodium, and because the maize is planted at normal spacing, there's no sacrifice of planting area by adding it. Desmodium is a legume plant that produces airborne chemicals that repel the Stembora moths or push them away from the maize. Desmodium also induces suicidal germination of the striga weed, clearing the soil of the parasitic weed. Being a legume, desmodium also fixes nitrogen in the soil, increasing nutrients and reducing soil degradation. On the border of their maize plot, farmers plant brachiaria or napier grass, a great animal feed. These grasses attract or pull the moths away from the maize. The moths lay their larvae on the grass, but they are unable to survive on the leaves, thus reducing the number of stembora moths. By implementing push-pull technology, farmers see increased maize yields for human consumption, as well as increased yields of livestock feed, which they can use on their own farm or sell to neighbours or at the local market. John lives in Petark, Zambia, with his wife and children. He began practicing push-pull in 2018 and his maize harvests have greatly improved. He says, push-pull has helped me and my family to have a steady source of income with good yields from our maize, now it's free from the stem borer. The soil has improved and I've started feeding my goats with desmodium. I want to thank Sendakal for bringing this kind of technology to us. I had never heard of it before. John plans to use his increased income to send his small children to school and reinvest in his farm. Battling with the effects of climate change, families like John's need our support to be able to grow crops that are resilient and sustainable. Push-pull technology is a simple, cost-effective and innovative solution and Sendica are committed to introducing the method across all of our programmes so that more families can benefit from the technology. By enabling widespread engagement, we can create a solution to a huge environmental challenge whilst helping to make farmers resilient in the face of climate change. Mm -hmm.